It's good to be in church on a Wednesday night, and um, I've got a few things to say before we even look at the scriptures tonight. Um, the first thing I want to say is that the Lord has helped us over this past year to look at certain possibilities in scripture. And when scripture only educates you and does not eliminate your heart that motivates your life, then scripture has no purpose in your life whatsoever. Uh, we are to walk in light as he is in light. And so we're not here to just open um, a seminary to understand God. We are here to find out what the Lord has to say to guide us. Now, over this past year, uh, there were statements we heard, like, um, we don't have a single copy of any message that Paul preached to build any of his churches. We don't. Well, apart from that, uh, we don't have a single copy of a message that uh, Jesus preached, more than the ones we read in the Gospels where he spoke for a little bit. But he spent three and a half years on this earth and preached almost every day messages that should lay a foundation in the hearts of his disciples. Well, I thought of all of these things, and Monday I woke up, and I was lying in my bed, and I was thinking, not Nebuchadnezzar, no, me, I was lying in my bed, and I was thinking that if I die, I really don't know what will happen with the work of God here in Mississauga. Because to take this work on, someone must have my vision, that's my concept. My concept is someone must have my vision. Someone must have the connections I make. Someone must know how this whole church here, local church, operates. Uh, someone must have an idea about uh, what to do with Ottawa, uh, what to do with the local district, what to do in daily operation and function of the church. And so I thought about this. And um, I said to myself, I'm waiting for someone uh, you know, this perfect person to come along. And then the concept came into my mind that Jesus, he left this and trusted his church in the hands of novices. They were fighting for position just prior to his, his death. And uh, they did not even know if he was going to establish the kingdom. The thief on the cross had a better understanding as to what God was going to do and in the establishment of the kingdom. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said unto that thief, he says, Verily I say unto you today, you will be with me in the kingdom or in paradise. But the disciples, when Jesus was ready to be taken up, they says, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? So the man that was dying had a greater understanding and he didn't get that because he had a revelation. He heard the same messages Jesus preached. But he did not take the message for granted. You see, I'm sitting here, and you sitting here might receive less than somebody that I send a tape to, and they sit down and listen to that. And I believe this church has, has done a tremendous job in the lives of a few people. When I started in this gospel assembly ministry, I made a statement, and you might have heard me say this, that uh, from my understanding of who will be in the bride of Christ, I said, if I can put five people in the bride of Christ, it is great accomplishment. Well, as the years go by, I want to change that. I would say if I can put five people in the kingdom, in the first resurrection somewhere, it's an accomplishment. I still hold on to that because my concept is that those in the bride of Christ are an immaculate group of individuals. They're not living in sin and using the term grace to justify their rebellion. They are following the Lamb. 
whithersoever he goeth. And so here, uh, I would like, and I would trust God as I ponder these things, I got up in the morning and I called Brother Richard. No, he called me. And I was glad he called me on Monday. And I said to him, I said, you know what I was thinking this morning in my bed is that if I die, my church will go to hell slowly. Um, I don't know if I've got elders that can work with each other or they criticize each other. I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure. When you're not sure, and then we are all old. By the time I die, or Brother John die before me, somebody else is falling. I'm looking for God to raise up some young ones with a vision for the work of God. And uh, that is important. And so we here are praying that God would give us fresh young blood, not old people that have sinned their lives in the past and they're worn out. Fresh blood. And so I told Brother Richard, I said, not only when my church go to hell, I said, if I, you die, your church will go to hell too. And then we start to name other churches where we don't have assistant pastors that can take over. And then there came this burden upon us because Brother, uh, Brother Brown in Texas, his associate pastor, or he is called a senior pastor, but the pastor for the church is Brother Gary Wright. And that man, if we're not, um, if we're not overly zealous in making a statement, it does not seem like his life uh, looks pretty good at this point in time. He is very sick. And uh, if God does not do a miracle in his life, he might die. We all will die. But I think Gary Wright must be about 65 years old, approximately. When I look at him, I'm guessing. Very fine man. And the last time I visited Texas, I sat down and listened to the most profound talk from this brother. And I sat there, and not a lot of men get me listening to their entire talk. There was a time when you're boring to me, I'd make a paper boat. That's why I have a lot of paper, like little square papers on next to my table. And if you're talking on the platform and you see me making a paper boat, quit. Because you're boring me. And a lot of times, a man would get up and he's going on with a long educational talk and my mind closes off. Because if his heart is not speaking, my ears are not listening. But that day when I sat down and listened to Brother Gary Wright, every part of his message was impactive to my life. And I believed in. And I think God finishes a work on the men that he has called. He finishes up a work before he puts them away. And we, I would like, before I die, that God finish up, finishes up the work in my life. And I would like not only my life, but other saints. We're not going to all be in the first resurrection. We're coming up in a resurrection, and we would possibly be in the kingdom. That is why we have the general harvest at the end of the thousand years. But you're looking at Paul's approach, and I would like to change my approach in presenting the gospel. Uh, if there is a warning for God's people, there's no soft way of presenting it. But Paul said here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1, Paul says, And now I, Paul, myself, I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. I like that because... When Jesus in, Acts, in, in Luke chapter 4, with gracious words, Jesus preached. And I would like to see the time come when God would raise up men that will not get up and preach at the people, but will minister to the people. So when Brother, Brother Dan was talking about uh, loving songs and songs of worship, I grew up loving songs of worship. I would... Um, I, I was not much of a person that had a lot of friends, but when we get together uh, with Brother Terry, we'll sing worldly songs. But you know, when I went full time, we'll get up from the mission home in the night 
And we had a pastor that wanted us to get in bed at a certain time, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. You were in bed, close the doors. When we are sure he is asleep, we will get up, put pillows on our bed, cover it up, take the guitar or two guitars and the maracas, you know those the maracas, and we'll walk down the road about 15 minutes away on a high bridge and we'll sit there and sing the God songs of glory. We're singing songs of glory. He's asleep. He does not even know we're doing that. But we're out there singing. It was the blessing. Uh, at night, I was telling, um, I think it might have been Nadine to there, somebody I was telling, that I grew up and I was in high school. And you heard my story, how I studied much in high school, because I had a vision. From the time I was 12 years old, my desire was to be in the ministry. 12 years old. So I had a goal set before me. So I would start to endure what was necessary to achieve that goal. So it means studying hard to finish high school. I would study hard to finish high school so I can be out of high school early so I can be full time in the ministry after helping my parents for a couple of years. Uh, giving mom, I worked. A secular, I worked as a school teacher, pupil teacher. When you get your check, I have a copy of the original pay stub. My first original pay stub, I've got it at home. $99.50 for the month. And that was good money back then. $99.50 on my first pay stub. Still got it. I kept that. I didn't want to get rid of it. And so when I work that, I give my mom and she does whatever she wants with that to pay the bills. I did not. She was there providing for us. My dad provided. We labored hard. And so when it comes to understanding life like that, we grew up and songs. When you can feel the press, you sing a godly song and it lifts your spirit. That's what David did when he sang and brought subsided the evil spirits in King Saul. Songs can be a blessing, but music is spiritual. And music could be either for the benefit of the worship or for the destruction of that service. Music could bring the presence of God in or invoke demon spirits and fleshly attitudes to take the service over. I like a majestic worship. I like worship that, you see, the first song we sang tonight was Down My Alley. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. See, when the, the angels and the, and the living creatures around the throne of God and the uh, 20 elders, 20 and 4 elders, they say, holy, holy, holy uh, unto the Lord God Almighty. They said, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. They worship God day and night. It's not how I feel in the worship. It's how I want to worship God in that worship. That is important. All right? And so we must come to the place, and I would like to come to the place that I can offer life to the hearers. Uh, I have my finger in First, Second Corinthians chapter 10, but I want a scripture, and I think it is in Isaiah. <clears throat> in Isaiah. And, and it might be in Isaiah 50. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a scripture where it says, uh, it says, In that day shall a man be a hiding place from the storm. Beautiful scripture. Um, uh, somebody help me to find that scripture. It says, In that day, a man shall be a hiding place from the storm, and a covert, uh, and a great rock, the shadow of a great rock. Um, 30? 32? Okay. Just one page over. There we go. Isaiah 32. And it tells us about the kingdom of God. But you know, we are kingdom people right here on this earth. And it tells us here in Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 1, Behold, the king shall reign in righteousness. 
Today we have rulers reigning with authority and power, but not righteousness. But there's coming a time when a king shall reign in righteousness. If he is not righteous, he can sit on the throne. A king, when he shall reign in righteousness, he shall not compromise with the evils of society. You're not put away in jail for years when you commit a crime that you need to be executed for. That's what it will be, righteousness. Um, you're not on speculative accusations put away. Uh, positive proof must be identified and then you're put away. Uh, there is coming a time when a king shall reign in righteousness. Uh, the scripture tells us about Jesus. Uh, here, in, hold your finger in all of these scriptures. Already I'm not even touching where I'm supposed to be heading in tonight. Uh, but um, I'm already all over the place except where I wanted to preach. And in Isaiah chapter 11, it speaks of Jesus. Uh, when he shall govern and rule in the coming kingdom. Uh, you know, Christmas time is the time when we talk about Jesus. And you'll find as we move into this year, as we move into this year, there'll be things that we will have to change on. Uh, we're not changing to become like the world. We're changing to unshackle ourselves from the world. All right? And it says, and there, sh and there shall come forth a rod, verse 1, Isaiah 11, out of the stem of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. And a branch, rod, branch, it's all describing Jesus, shall grow forth out of his roots. And there's a scripture, it says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's the Holy Ghost shall rest upon him. And along with the Holy Ghost, the spirit of wisdom will be upon him. The spirit of understanding shall be upon him. The spirit of counsel shall be upon him. The spirit of might shall be upon him. The spirit of knowledge shall be upon him. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. The seven candlesticks before the throne of God are the seven spirits of God resting on one individual. When we get the Holy Ghost, we go hog wild when we get the little touch. Can you imagine uh, somebody having seven spirits on him? They'll break the wall down. No, no, no. The Holy Ghost is given to all flesh to bring us into submission to God. And when you come to the place of maturity, emotions do not control you anymore. You are controlled by the Word of God and by the principle. See, God tells you to love your enemies because we have this anger against our enemies. God does not. God does not have anger against His enemy. The Bible was written for our understanding, not God's vocabulary. God works with a principle. He says the wages of sin is death. If his son, if, uh, if an elder sins before all, he must be rebuked before all. If a, a child of God in the church rebels and does something contrary, worthy of death, death, he must be put to death. John made that statement. He says, if you see your brother sin a sin which is unto death, I say that you should not pray for him. What does that mean? There, in that period of time, there was a sin that demanded capital punishment. The thief on the cross was one of those. Jesus did not pray, come down from the cross. He did not work a miracle for that man to come down from the cross. That was a man that died in the right position in his heart. So he sinned a sin which demanded the death sentence. Don't pray that God remove the death sentence. Let him die. But pray that God save his soul before he dies. And so John said, if you see a brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, pray for him. But if you see your brother sin, a sin which is unto death, I don't say that you should pray for him. There's a sin unto death, and there is a sin not unto death. Now, all sin is unto death, but that's not what John was talking about. And if we sin 
a sin which is unto death, we must receive the appropriate judgment for that sin. God is a just God, and he will give every man according as his, uh, as his iniquity is. Uh, every man shall receive a just recompense of reward. You do good, you will receive good. But with God, you see, when you hurt me, I want to hurt you back. I got my feelings hurt. You don't hurt the feelings of God. He does not have feelings in the sense like you're thinking. He works with a principle. If his son sinned, his son had to die. If the righteous turn from their righteousness and start to transgress the laws of God, they will come under the judgment of God. And if the unrighteous man repenteth and turn to God, he comes under the blessings of God. God is not prejudiced in making judgment. He has laws, and that is why he has laws. Transgression of God's law is sin. You don't find there's not another word for sin. Sin is sin. Yeah, that's right. Small sin, big sin, sin is sin. And so here Jesus, uh, he is described, and in the spirit of the Lord shall be rest upon him, all of these spirits, verse 3, and God shall make him of quick understanding. You're not going to be a dud. Jesus will not sit on the kingdom and fall asleep. When he sits on the kingdom to govern. Now think about it. 144,000, which we'll take a glimpse at maybe tonight. But 144,000 little Jesuses. Each one of the bride members that has immortality has the ability to snap his finger and abolish all the evil in this world. They have the power to eliminate evil with a snap of their finger and to establish righteousness. But that's not how God operates. It takes them 1,000 years because they will not snap their finger. Mankind must go through the process of growth and development and the kingdom will take time for his establishment. Are you following me? Yes, All right, that is why it takes a thousand years before the kingdom is established. It is the kingdom of God, yes, but imperfect until the thousand years are over when all evil will be eliminated, when the, when the false prophet and all evil will be gone, when Satan himself will be eliminated, when every ungodly man at the end of the thousand years would be eliminated, and cast into the lake of fire, which is not fire, but it is the second death. The lake of fire is the second death. It's describing that fire that continuously, continuously burn in Gehenna, that valley of Hinnom in, in the Mideast, where they always had garbage. You see, here we get our garbage picked up. Back there, they put the garbage in a garbage location, and they always have fire burning garbage. I take my garbage today, not Monday and Tuesday. I take my garbage anytime I have garbage. Put it in that valley, and whatever it is, if I had old fish bones, whatever, it goes into the same valley, and it burns up. And when you go there, the worms seem to have everlasting life. There's always worms there. No, 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 the worms are almost like everlasting, but it does not mean God has given the worms and the maggots everlasting life. No, they seem to be forever there. But there comes a time when the perpetual hills will bow and the everlasting mountains will be scattered. The word everlasting describes an age lasting. Last as long as its purpose is, is complete. So when we think about it, this is what will happen. And Jesus here, when he sits down to govern, he'll be of quick understanding. Every bride member will be of quick understanding. In a coming kingdom, when the first resurrection happens, it does not resurrect every child of God. It resurrects only the staff that Jesus needs to establish the kingdom. First phase, bride. Second phase, the celestial bodies that will stand before the throne. Some sitting on throne, some standing before the throne. All are a part of the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot sit in that 
group that would rule and reign for a thousand years. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So they would sit there for a thousand years. But the sinner during that kingdom period will die being a thousand years old. And during that period of time, they'll not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. That's the plan of God. They will hurt during that time. But by the time it comes to the end, there'll be no more hurt. Why? Because the knowledge of God will fill everybody's head and make them educated. No, the knowledge of God will fill their hearts. And every man will have a personal experience with God. The reason why people backslide and leave the church is because they lack genuine conversion. And I was telling the dean this morning, I said, I had this vision to be in the ministry in my early days, 12 years. And so I, I worked hard and, and travailed hard and tried to get out of school. By the time I was 18 years, a little over 18, I was in the ministry full time. Long path, rugged path God took us through. And uh, you had to trust God for every meal. You had to trust God. You did not have credit cards. You did not have bank accounts that you can depend on. You talk about a bank account, I don't, what's that? As a young man, I didn't know what a bank account was. They had the banks. They had people that had accounts, but we barely got money we keep in a little box because the church did not have a lot of money. What, you going to go open the account with $50 and need it back in two days after? No, you keep your money in a box and you spend. You trust God. And I remember the days. I remember that day when I sat in the house and I looked at the two boys with me. And I said, well, we don't have money to buy even uh, matches. So we have one box of match, one single match in the box. I said, so here's what we'll do. We need the fire to light the stove. So we need to light this kerosene lamp and unload so we can always have some fire to light the stove because we had flour, we had potatoes, and that's good enough. Potato and flour can make wonders uh, for a man that's in the ministry. You understand what I'm saying? And that's how we live. We trusted God, but we never starved. We never begged for money and we never starved. And that was something because you had to pray that God supply your needs. And when we got married, and we went into that environment where she came into that place that she had to learn how to trust God. That's what we did. It was not an easy life. When we bought fried chicken, it was like a birthday party. And I'm talking fried chicken. We're not talking about big legs. No, little pieces, uh, fried chicken. Uh, you get that and it's a treat. You take a bottle of Pepsi and you split it up and everybody get a little sip. You add water and lime, spread it. Our favorite drink in the afternoon was lime water with some sugar inside. But what it did, did it hurt me? No. I thought it was not good, but you know, I enjoyed it. And so when I was in high school, I would go, um, got my schoolwork uh, to do, and, but I'll go to a crusade at night. I remember one day my big brother sat there and waited for me to come home. My dad would also wait. And I'm coming home 11 o'clock at night because you're going into Blackbush Pole to preach the gospel, and then you're returning back out from the, in the dark. All the way home, we sang songs. I'm so glad I belong to Jesus. When you hear a van is passing and a lot of singing is happening, we're coming from the crusade. That's how it was. We were happy to serve God. We're not depressed when we came to church. Coming to church and being in a service was the best thing that can happen to you. And when I came home that one night, I remember my brother stood up there and he says, if you fail this exam that you're studying for, I'll bust your face. And I got certain subjects in that exam before he got it. Everything I wrote for that I wrote in the exams, I passed. 
And what the school did not allow me to enter for, I entered on the outside and I passed. And by the time I was, by the time we were, I was 21, 22 years old when we got married. I was 22 years old. By the time I was 22 years old, I was fifth in the family, fifth child in the family. My big brother was an agriculture officer. My second brother worked for the general post office as a, over the parcel department that transferred him to England. Third brother, well, he was the tough guy. He was a school teacher. His wife was a school teacher. They were fine. My sister was house girl. You know, she stayed home, went to commercial school. I was the fifth boy that went full time. When I was 21, I had the first house in the family. 21 years old, full time. I owned the first house among my brothers and sisters. And somebody had a gall to say, he got to be having money from America. I don't know why they think money grows in, on trees in America. But you know, I'm saying all of that to say God was good. And you look back at that path you're coming from, and that is what has brought me to where I am today. I cannot curse the bridges I crossed on. They were precious days. And Jesus, when he comes to rule, he, God will make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge according to the sight of his eyes. He won't see you and make a judgment or hear somebody tell him something, nor they reprove after the hearing of his ears. Somebody says, well, you know that brother Terry, he's not doing good. Here is what I got to tell you. If I come under the influence of anybody in this church to make judgment against one person, I'm not qualified to sit on the throne in the kingdom. I can listen to your talk, hear your complaint, but my judgment must be righteousness. It must be what I feel God wants me to do. And I can't close my ears to what people are saying because somebody might tell me something that has some legitimate um, information about it. But I must make judgment. Brother Terry must have different judgment than Brother John. Brother John is a different individual. If I was a father and have six kids, I can't judge them all on the same principles. They're all different personalities. I look at Timothy and I look at Jeremiah, two different personalities. I can't expect Jeremiah to follow Timothy's example. Jeremiah has to find his own path. Timothy has to find his own path. You understand what I'm saying? And so you look, and that is how the kingdom would be established. Individuals will not judge according to the principles of society. Listen, I cannot be motivated I appreciate God for men in my past. And I'm talking about men all the way back in, in Pentecost. Men that I think prayed more than anyone else. Men whose ministry produced miracles. But I'm glad when God brought me into the fellowship, into the body of Christ. In 1975, I was privileged and honored when God brought me into this fellowship. And like we say, he was bringing me out of Babylon. But that's only a small part of Babylon. But he was bringing me out of apostate Christianity into a fellowship that he, uh, Jesus, is supposed to be the head of. You understand what I'm saying? The Lord was working in my life to save me. And so here I am tonight. And when I look back at the past five, six years, seven years, eight years, ten years, I think we are deviating from the path of holiness that we started on, and we're being sidetracked. And the moment you're sidetracked, you're getting carried away with diverse uh, information and customs. And I would like to pray that God give us direction, take us back on the path that we started on to begin with. You understand what I'm saying? I must be able to have the wisdom and you must be able to have the wisdom to recognize where we have deviated from the path. And so here in Isaiah chapter 32, uh, chapter 32 of Isaiah, it says, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment 
And a man shall be in hiding place. A man will be a hiding place. Somebody is getting into trouble, a hiding place from the wind. You're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, every wind of fashion, every wind of ungodliness. If you're tossed, run to a man that can be in hiding place from the wind that's blowing out there in the world. I pray that God makes every minister not a compromiser to evil, but a hiding place from the storms, from the wind of life, from the negatives of life. God has to deal with your spirit before you can come to that place. Being firm does not mean that you're hard and unsympathetic. No, you must have the grace and, and meekness of Christ, and that's what we're heading back into. It says, a man shall be in hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest. Your boat is tossed to and fro. The winds are ready to sink your ship. And you barely see a little cove that you pull the ship in. They are men that God will raise the pastors after his own heart that will give you that rescue. Amen. Patch your boat. Get you to go back out when the storm is past. The tempest is gone. And if you can't find ministers like that, that is what ministers ought to be. I'm praying that this year, the Lord would help me to better bring myself into that place of maturity. That I can be there, not only for you in the church, but there for anyone that can run into me. That is why I listened to Brother Dan tonight. And he was telling us something that did not relate with any message, but it relates with the life. And he was telling you about needs and how people can run to him. And that excites him. Well, that excites me. It excites me when somebody comes over and says, are you a child Christian? I can tell. Because you're light. You don't have to write, I'm a Christian on your shirt. But your life. And the presence of God in your life can radiate something that gives confidence. We need more of the presence of God and the transforming work of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And so here it says, He shall be rivers, a covert from the tempest, and rivers of water in a dry place. Somebody says, I, I'm so dry in my spirit. I don't know when last I felt a touch from God. I need, a, I need your presence, God, in my life. You find a man and you find a church and you find a group of people that can offer you that. Not goosebumps. I mean something that will quench your thirsty soul. Not a drop, not a cup. Rivers of water, it says, in a dry place. And the last year it says, and a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Somebody says, I'm tired of religion. I'm tired of uh, fooling around. I'm tired of going over the same thing. I'm tired of the routine. Well, you know, we came here last Wednesday. We sang two songs, three songs, and we went over the routine, and I went, became in a rebel. I left a rebel. That's, that should be ended. We should come in thirsty and go out quenched. We should come in dry and go out moist with the Spirit of God in our lives. We need that kind of church that will offer that to us. Well, I come in, uh, you know, when my voice was fine, but by the time I'm leaving, I have laryngitis because I scream so much because I thought God was deaf. See, somewhere down the line, we've got to change some things about us. We've got to find out where we got these ideas from. And some people would not like me for it because I follow Brother Goodwin as he followed Christ. And I don't follow him in all his ways that he followed Christ. I still need to improve some of that. But he was my teacher. And my teacher was a human. He had flaws, he had weaknesses, he had things about him. I don't want to copy. <clears throat> I love David, but I'm not going to copy him. Yeah. I love Paul, but I'm not going to copy all the things he did. I love Solomon. I read the wisdom, but I 
stay away from his foolishness and his disobedience. I love Paul, I love Peter, but I don't want to do some of the things he did. But you know, when I look at the end of the lives of these men, I can incorporate all that they did. Paul says, I'm now ready to be offered. He says, the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight, finished the course, kept the faith. Henceforth, not me alone, but anyone that would love his appearing can continue and do the same thing. And so may God help us. So back here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is where we're going tonight. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little teaser because there's something else. There's a whole bulk of other stuff that I'd like to share with you. But it says here in 1 Second, uh, Second Corinthians 10, Paul says, he says, I, Paul... Last effort to save the church at Corinth. In that same chapter, he says here, For though, verse 8, I would boast some more, somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. That I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Some people says he's got, can you imagine, he started the church. He brought the church to a certain place and condition in God. And there was a time in this man's life, he was writing to save the church. And here is what they said. For his letters say they. An element in the church that says his letters say they are weighty and, pow and powerful. But when you see the man, his bodily presence is weak and his speech creates problems among the people. Jeremiah's speech made problems too. Yes. Isaiah's speech made problems too. And so did Jesus' speech. He said, I come not as in peace but a sword. A man's enemy might end up to be there of his own household. Because daddy never did it that way, so we're not going to do it that way. Listen, daddy is dead and gone. We got to find new methods and ways of transportation. Daddy might have ridden a horse on his way to Hamilton. But we're going to take an automobile. Paul might have spent hours traveling on a ship before he could visit a site. Made three missionary journeys. I'm going to take a jumbo jet when I'm going to India or Africa. Can you imagine I take a boat? Take a ship? Steamboat? I'll reach there for Christmas. But when I'm thinking about it, we have got to find what God wants us to do today. We have got to examine our religion and find out if there's anything we did, we are doing that the devil has started. It is necessary. Because remember, the person we are dealing with, this entity we are dealing with, he is subtle. He has toppled kingdoms. He has made kings look like they're idiots. He's got businessmen. He's got this world in his hand. They sing a song out there. In his hand, he's got the whole world. God's got it. No, no, no. The devil has got the world, but God's got the devil in his hand. He can do whatever he wants. And when we think of the enemy... If you keep running on the same treadmill and we do the same things we have always done, Brother Goodwin said one time, I don't know where we got the quotation from, he says, if we do the things we have always done, we'll continue to be the people we have always been. There'll be no spiritual progress. We'll be going around Mount Sinai over and over and over when we should be heading towards the promised land. What could should be a two weeks journey 
can take us 40 years. See, when God told Nebuchadnezzar to, through Daniel that you're the head of gold, that's a wonderful thing. The Lord told David he was going to be king over Israel. That's a wonderful thing. God told Joseph, give him dreams that he would be governing his brother. Wonderful thing. But the process to make that head of gold gold took seven years of eating grass and running like a wild animal in the, in the forest. It took Joseph a lot of days in prison. Ups and downs. It took that King David, who was anointed king over Israel, years in Cave Adullam, fleeing for his life. And it will take you some time if you have a goal. If your goal is just to sit in church and beat the ear, that's all you'll end up and do. If your goal is to head to the kingdom and to be cleansed of all evil that this world offers, then it's necessary that we examine ourselves. That's correct. I'm more careless than Sister Chandri. Sister Chandri over there, as soon as her heart goes one beat, contrary, she's ready to check up on it. She has a right. She has a reason. And she is cautious. I prefer not to know. That's not good. I need to know. I should take my spirituality like you take your health. That I, anything I feel like is wrong in my spirit, examine it. And that's what I need to do. I need to examine my spiritual life. As some people examine their physical life. Because you cannot take things for granted. Why are we doing this? Well... There's a lot of things that this year I would, by the help of God, change. And you'll find that the lessons that we'll receive will address these issues. Amen. Because if the world is running east, and there are things that the world is involved in, that... The beast has provided, and the woman that rides the beast has provided, when Hindu, Muslim, atheist, Christian, Buddhist, and everybody find a common ground that they're all united on, ask who has provided that? Who has provided sports? Well, they only want that sport. You can go in the, in, the, in the dome stadium only if you're a Christian. No. It provides entertainment for the whole world in spite of who you are. You see, all these forms, fashions, sports, religion, in, in the sense, general sense, anything that amalgamates the world, we've got to be careful to watch that. Christmas is one of those. Why is everybody so busy about Christmas? Why is everybody so excited about New Year? Why you want to come to church in New Year and you miss the other services? These are all things we have to examine ourselves because this year, let's serve God. And stop following the beast. And may God help us because I hope by the ending of this week, I'll be able to talk to you a little more seriously. That I'll show you a little bit more from the word of God. Why we need to examine ourselves and sanctify ourselves from the world. But before I close tonight, do you know where Daniel was when he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. What country was he in? He was in Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylon. Can I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If you do, you need to be saved. Can I sing the Lord's song? They wouldn't accept you. You go and preach this message in some <coughs> apostate church, 
They'll, they'll, they'll not act. They'll close their ears to you. And this is a sweet message because I'm trying to fulfill what Paul is writing here. He says in the scripture, he says, um, he said, with all meekness. And I'm hoping, he says, I, Paul beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, that being absent and bold toward you. He says, I'm coming to you. I'm Paul. He could come there because he was an aggressive man one time. That aggressive spirit he has as a Pharisee that will persecute the church, he had to lose that. That is why you might think a preacher is really doing good preaching along, and you think the other brother, he's so calm and quiet. Guess what? <clears throat> why is a preacher fighting with the people? Calm and quiet is good for me. What do you think Jesus was? Calm and quiet. And somebody says, well, he ain't got the anointing. Well, my friend, your, mis your misunderstanding as what, of what the anointing is, is going to lead you astray. And may God help us as we move in this year, as we get closer to the this year and as we start the year, we'd like to find out how we can slowly develop the meekness and gentleness of Christ by receiving his spirit in our life and having the fruit of the spirit established in our life that we can measure out, reflect God's... You see, I get the grace of God. Not because I'm good, because he is good. I get the unmerited favor of God bestowed upon me. May God help me to reflect with meekness and gentleness. May God help us, because I would like, by the ending of this year, 2020, if God help us, I want to have men that can be oracles of God, that can be that great rock in a weary land, that cove from the tempest, that rivers of water in a dry place. May God can help us. We're not going to be immaculate, but we can at least be that source that someone can run to me not to compromise religion but offer them hope and salvation may God help us as a local church not only to be preaching and to each other but to be able to reach out to our community and offer life to those people that are dying out there because their blood will God require at our hands tonight it's good being in church and I'm pleased talking to you can we pray Father, tonight we thank you once again for Wednesday night. We thank you, Father, for the great example of our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for scripture that can challenge us and mold us for the future. Please give us the wisdom to hold on to things, whether traditional or whatever, that you want us to hold on to, and yet at the same time, to gracefully shake things that would damn our soul and build up an exalted, self-righteous attitude in us. Teach us to be holy, Father. Help us to walk in your ways. Bless this weekend coming up, Father, and bless every child of God present here. We commit our year into your hands, and we pray you lead us every step of the way. In Jesus' wonderful name we ask it. Amen and amen. <clears throat> it's good to be in church on a Wednesday night, and um, I've got a few things to say before we even look at the scriptures tonight. Um, the first thing I want to say is that the Lord has helped us over this past year to look at certain possibilities in scripture, and when scripture only educates you, and does not eliminate your heart that motivates your life, then scripture has no purpose in your life whatsoever. Uh, we are to walk in light as he is in light. And so we're not here to just open um, a seminary to understand God. We are here to find out what the Lord has to say to guide us. Now, over this past year, uh, there were statements we heard, like, um, we don't have a single copy of any message that Paul preached 
to build any of his churches. We don't. Well, apart from that, uh, we don't have a single copy of a message that Jesus preached, more than the ones we read in the Gospels where he spoke for a little bit. But he spent three and a half years on this earth and preached almost every day messages that should lay a foundation in the hearts of his disciples. Well, I thought of all of these things, and Monday I woke up, and I was lying in my bed, and I was thinking, not Nebuchadnezzar, no, me, I was lying in my bed, and I was thinking that if I die, I really don't know what will happen with the work of God here in Mississauga. Because... To take this work on, someone must have my vision. That's my concept. My concept is someone must have my vision. Someone must have the connections I make. Someone must know how this whole church here, local church, operates. Uh, someone must have an idea about uh, what to do with Ottawa, uh, what to do with the local district, what to do in daily operation and function of the church. And so I thought about this. And um, I said to myself, I'm waiting for someone, uh, you know, this perfect person to come along. And then the concept came into my mind that Jesus, he left this and trusted his church in the hands of novices. They were fighting for position just prior to his, his death. And uh, they did not even know if he was going to establish the kingdom. The thief on the cross had a better understanding as to what God was going to do and in the establishment of the kingdom. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said unto that thief, he says, Verily I say unto you today, you will be with me in the kingdom or in paradise. But the disciples, when Jesus was ready to be taken up, they says, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? So the man that was dying had a greater understanding, and he didn't get that because he had a revelation. He heard the same messages Jesus preached, but he did not take the message for granted. You see, I'm sitting here, and you sitting here might receive less than somebody that I send the tape to and they sit down and listen to that. And I believe this church has, has done a tremendous job in the lives of a few people. When I started in this gospel assembly ministry, I made a statement, and you might have heard me say this, that uh, from my understanding of who will be in the bride of Christ, I said, if I can put five people in the bride of Christ, it is great accomplishment. Well, as the years go by, I want to change that. I would see if I can put five people in the kingdom, in the first resurrection somewhere. It's an accomplishment. I still hold on to that because my concept is that those in the bride of Christ are an immaculate group of individuals. They're not living in sin and using the term grace to justify their rebellion. They are following the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. And so here, uh, I would like, and I would trust God as I ponder these things, I got up in the morning and I called Brother Richard. No, he called me, and I was glad he called me on Monday. And I said to him, I said, you know what I was thinking this morning in my bed? is that if I die, my church will go to hell slowly. Um, I don't know if I've got elders that can work with each other or they criticize each other. I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure. When you're not sure, and then we are all old. By the time I die, or Brother John die before me, somebody else is falling. I'm looking for God to raise up some young ones with a vision for the work of God. And uh, that is important. And so we here are praying that God would give us fresh, young blood. Not old people that have sinned their lives in the past and they're worn out. Fresh blood. 
And so I told Brother Richard, I said, not only will my church go to hell, I said, if I, you die, your church will go to hell too. And then we start to name other churches where we don't have assistant pastors that can take over. And then there came this burden upon us because Brother, uh, Brother Brown in Texas.